came across uh, uh, about actually 10 years ago about the uh, uh, research done actually the Frostic Center in, you know, in California, your state, in Pasadena, California. Mm -hmm. And they have a school for children with uh, learning disorders. And uh, they have uh, followed, again, the student for over 20 years. And they have uh, observed that there are a few traits that will predict who are the children who will do well in adult life despite having uh, learning disorders. So uh, when I have seen their presentations in conference on learning disorders, it's it, the thing that's quite, uh, they usually uh, start a presentation showing, let's uh, say, who is this child who's seen like a beautiful scenery from California, like the beach, right? Mm -hmm. And who, uh, and the ones who are unfortunately, let's say a, a prison cell, right? And they and based on, you know, real stories, right? And one of the pictures they show on this, their presentations, actually from a, a, one of their previous students who became a millionaire, living in, you know, still in California, uh, there. And then, uh, so they, they, they talk about this, these traits that they found. And I remember when I, I, uh, I watched this, uh, uh, this presentation, I found, oh, maybe this has some relation to our work also in mental health. So that's a thought, mm -hmm. you know, maybe let's talk about it. So so what is there, this, these factors that they found? So they found that this, this uh, success attributes, how they call it, as being like self-aware, being proactive, be perseverant, right? Mm -hmm. Setting goals, uh, the presence of uh, and use of support system, and the, the presence uh, also the use of emotional coping strategies. So my, my question for you is how you feel when you see these these factors, right? And now, how you know they they relate to daily work? How you see that in a relation to do that has do see any relation to the the same when you see our patients and I see our clients, you know, who are the ones uh, do you see a similarity there? Are factors that will predict or the, who, who are the who will do well? Absolutely, and thank you again, Alex, for having me on. I really appreciate it. Um, when it comes to any challenge, whether that's uh, behavioral or otherwise, sometimes it's the environment we grow up in, um, orthodox or, uh, or not. I'm, you know, it's really interesting when you look at these, uh, these, these points of uh, these data points, you know, self-awareness, proactivity, perseverance, goal setting, presence and use of support systems, emotional coping strategies. As mental health uh, practitioners, we understand that these are cornerstones of, of you know, social success, good mental health, right? Having at least one, one constant support system that has that unconditional positive regard, learning how to be proactive in overcoming your challenges. Um, and having the insight and awareness to know what those challenges are in the first place, right? And, uh, you know, with this particular population, you know, um, when you're talking about children with disabilities, uh, whether that's ADD, ADHD, um, social problems, uh, which, you know, could also include trauma and depends on the environment you grow up in. Um, it, I think it's a compilation and it doesn't surprise me that it's not just one of these things, it's a compilation of these things, right? And I've, you know, in, in the work that I do with a lot of clients, you know, by the time I get them, I've worked with children and I've worked with teens and I've worked with gang youth and I primarily work with adults, um, but I definitely see points of intervention, right? And and when you're doing an intake or I'm doing an intake with, with the consumer, a lot of the the work being done in, his, in, a, in the intake and going through the questions is to look for these um, these points of intervention for future implications, right? When if you if you're going through somebody's educational history and their social history, and you see there's this common thread um, where where they were not provided the adequate support or they didn't know how to navigate a particular social challenge. You know those lived experiences they they manifest in, in you know your frame of reference as you grow as you turn into an adult and if you didn't learn how to navigate those challenges appropriately or overcome your circumstance through resources or knowing how to advocate for yourself and communicate assertively then those are going to continue to be things that trip you up down the road and this you know as one moves across their lifespan right into adulthood 
then you run into the problems of missed milestones, right? That whole uh, Eric Erickson psychological stages of development, right? If you start to feel like you're not being generative, you're not keeping up with your peers, uh, that you've missed the boat, right? Um, the train left without you. You know, if you start to feel like you're you're not hitting your milestones in terms of your quality of life and accomplishments, that just adds additional stress, right? And so um, I, I'm not surprised by that data because it makes sense that this, those are the the cornerstones that if implemented, especially early on, then someone, you know, with those challenges learns how to empower themselves, right? They learn how to be proactive, um, but that doesn't just happen, right? Those things are not usually figured out on your own, right? It requires some sort of guidance and counseling, how to think outside the box, right? Because if you have ADD or you have ADHD, you're not going to necessarily fit the mold, right, of the classroom. You're not going to be able to necessarily go through the the linear process that, quote, everybody else goes through with the same expectations by those, you know, the gatekeepers, the teachers, the the employers, right? Sometimes you have to work with your strengths and certain stages of life, certain um, environments don't highlight your strengths, they highlight your weaknesses. I find that to be the case oftentimes in working with clients with a bipolar disorder um, because they have so many ups and downs, they're unpredictable and a typical nine to five, it doesn't make sense, right? If they're working for somebody else on a nine to five, if they have a de major depressive episode, they can't just be out for two weeks. They'll lose their job. They'll fail out of school, right? And miss exams. And so learning how to work with your challenges and not swimming upstream that's the trick, right? What are your thoughts? Yeah, um, yeah, I fully, I fully agree with you, uh, Patrick. You know, as, uh, you know the, I know the, the question I, I have is how can we help our uh, the children, right, to develop or or adults, you know, young adults or adults who uh, still don't have the the traits, right? How we, we can support them to develop it. But uh, uh, for sure, uh, uh, one thing that uh, that I found that for me was uh, uh, that what I observed when I, when I learned about this uh, trait is, you know, these are not just traits about uh, success in, in learning disorders, right? These are, are, are traits who, who will predict, uh, right? Uh, like I think I said, right? Will predict who, uh, who are the uh, uh, teenagers or who will become a successful adults, right? And these are and. Uh, and these are the traits, of course, we, we want to encourage in our patients, you know, children, teenagers, and adults. And then, then I also kind of connect a little with the, the, uh, with the use of the resources, right? All these, the therapy. And that's what, uh, when, one of the questions I, I have uh, had over the years is, uh, how much can we really help our patients or how can we help them best, right? And, uh, and I really believe talk and seeing a counselor seeing a psychiatrist can be a very important step to do that, right? But uh, when, I don't know how much you share about this, conclusion, this thought, but one of the things that I learned over the years is that one of the best predictors really of the, you know, the teenagers or that I see with anxiety and depression, what the factor that will predict who are the ones we're going to do the best is how much they use the resources uh, I recommend, right? So mm -hmm. recommend books, recommend websites, you know, this is, it is being proactive is really one of the most important uh, you know, traits, you know, we, we can have to, that will also predict how we're going to do well, right? Because uh, unfortunately a scenario that we, you know, it's, it's sad to see, but it does happen a lot is when our, say recommend, you know, a self-help book, and then our patients uh, sometimes unfortunately, don't read it, right? And then if you then end up relying, in my case, being a physician, a psychiatrist, right? I do, you know, we do prescribe medications and and medications can help well, in a lot of situations are extremely important, like bipolar disorder, schizophrenia. Yeah, there's there one you know, a major component of the treatment of these problems, of course, of this. this uh, but uh, uh, when it's dealing with anxiety, uh, dep uh, depression, but even ADHD, just developing these coping skills or coping strategies can be as important, sometimes more important, right? For like uh, the studies indicate, for example, I think you know, like obsessive compulsive disorder. Mm -hmm. The the therapy on average is is more effective than medication for OCD for obsessive compulsive disorder. So yes, medication uh, can help, but on average the the ERP right response response prevention one kind of the right the treatment for obsessive compulsive disorder is on average twice as effective 
as the medication, right? So when we, it's sad for us, right? When you see our patient, we recommend, yes, do the, the, the exposure, uh, exposure response prevention, the cognitive therapy for, uh, for OCD, and our patients are not committed and they only, only rely on the medication. You're really limiting how much you can improve, right? So that's why, so that's why uh, I, I felt like, okay, these this traits are, are Again, they, they really, this is not just for learning disorders. Is there, are there, they're really who traits who predict who are, again, our patients, who, how they would do well. And that, that definitely we want support them to develop, again, being self-aware. And and, uh, and I think we both share the belief, right, that the, the books, right, can help on that, right, when you read the books. Oh, yeah. about, mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, they say uh, leaders are readers. Right. <laughs> and so, um, you know, that's the beauty. Thing. The beautiful thing about a book is you're compacting, you know, decades of potentially of somebody's lived experience. And, you know, they're, they're compacting all those nuggets of wisdom into a, you know, digestible <laughs> book. So it's like almost like the Matrix, you know, where you can just download all of those skills, you know, in a short period of time into your mind. And um, when, it, you know, we could talk a lot about books. I, I love, love, love books. I'm a podcast addict. I love audiobooks. Um, uh, now, when it comes to absorbing information, right, it's really important to understand how you absorb information best, right? Um, I can sit and read a book, but sitting and reading a book is not necessarily the best way I learn. I'm, I'm very visual and I'm very audio. So I can listen to an audio book, you know, front to back while I'm gardening you know, doing the dishes, going for a walk. And it, the listening for me really frees up the ability to, to think about life application, to absorb um, and, and envision in my life how, how that would play out. Whereas if I'm, you know, another person might prefer to sit and, you know, turn the pages and, and give it their full attention. So I think it, you know, really depends on your learning style. And that's really important. In, no, Patrick, that's uh, yeah. very interesting you mentioned about the audiobooks because uh, uh, the, I know we were doing this interview today. That I told you before we start the interview, right? This is my second interview using this uh, platform, right? And last, uh, just uh, three days ago, I did the first one and I interviewed uh, Gigi Whiteside. He, uh, Whiteside. She's a, a, a special education teacher in Georgia, in the, the, in the mm -hmm. US too. And then we will talk about uh, Texas Rich Technology, talking about audio, all about audio books, right? And so we're talking exactly about that. And then the story I told uh, Gigi in the interview was that I got a Kindle with uh, read for me with text to speech, right? Mm -hmm. About twelve years ago, and that was last uh, when I bought uh, the, the Kindle with text to speech. It was again, it was I did not buy any more books. You know, I just listen, mm -hmm. I listen to everything with text to speech or audio books. I'm the same way, right? I listen, you know, just this weekend I have to drive, listen to audio book in the car, and that's uh, almost all the books. Uh, I'm the same way. And I feel like when, uh, you know, you listen to audio book or sometimes doing, uh, going to the gym or the, when it's possible, right? The exercise, save time. feel like you, you can absorb more the, the, the content, right? And, is, uh, and, uh, and uh, I think, and I was uh, told also in uh, uh, Gigi websites in the interview again, just three days ago, that uh, I found that again, just having the Kindle, with the, reading, uh, starting reading all these books with text to speech and then reading a lot more, I have read more over the last 12 years, probably the, the rest of my life before, right? So it was, uh, I think uh, this technology was the, have, was the technology has the biggest impact in my adult life, it was just uh, just because I can, I can read more, I can learn more, right? So my reading is really listening, right? Like you, so, and that's, uh, I, I think, uh, yeah, we're really on the same page there, right? We, you want to make the, to give tips for our clients, by our patients about uh, how to, uh, uh, access that information but uh mm -hmm. is but uh, really trying to make a way to make it to reach it to again access the information can be life-changing right it can really life change oh, absolutely yeah yeah very much so and i think you know i know in my experience working with the clients that's always top of mind figuring out how do we get positive stimulus in front of this person you know because that's what that was a saving grace for me I came from a very unorthodox background. I had my own challenges, especially academically. And um, for those who know me, I didn't step foot into a classroom until college. So I had a lot of catching up to do, you know, and, um, you know, it was a compilation of things, but definitely learning how to work within 
my own learning style and figuring out how to get the right information, you know, it's a game changer, right? And when I was going, st starting off in college or in high school, they didn't have the, the internet, but it really wasn't much of a thing yet. And so with so much information being accessible now, it's much easier to be intentional and proactive about getting the right information in front of us. Now with that also comes a lot of competition. There's a lot of things competing for our attention and they're not necessarily good things. Social media can be a blessing and it can be a curse, right? And I think that's one reason I love podcasts so much. Podcasts and audiobooks is because it's very targeted. You're listening to a particular book or a particular show for a particular need or reason. And it almost becomes like a mantra. You're training your mind. And we can talk a lot about that. You know, just training your thought patterns, right? Your dendrites, the way your brain prefers to think by the type of stimuli that we are intentionally putting in front of us that we're absorbing on a consistent basis right oh yeah fully agree. i fully agree with you patrick you know i mm -hmm. i i i know there Sometimes I'm concerned when I see uh, teenagers, let's say, reading content that's kind of dark, right? Kind of mm -hmm. dark books. And they, you know, this can have, of course, it probably has a negative impact on their mood, right? And there's all this, uh, no, fortunately, again, we're in a good time now to access uh, books as audio or, or text to speech, right? And there is really amazing books out there, right? There's all amazing self help books. There are amazing uh, guides for cognitive therapy, right? Um, all these books can be assessed very easily today, right? So, uh, you know, uh, one story I tell, tell, and I actually recorded one of, my, one of the videos out my web, my, day, my YouTube channel about it. It was about the book, How to Influence and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and the, it's, one of, it's one of my favorites too. So, yeah, the, 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 the story, and uh, I tell, and I tell when I have medical students in my office with me too, I tell, always tell them, I learn more about talking with my patients reading this book, the How to Win Friends and Influence People, than any psychiatry book. And I have read mm -hmm. a lot of psychiatry books, right? But the, the How to Win Friends is the and Influence People is the book has had the most impact, my, uh, most positive impact on my life, personally, probably uh, personally and professionally. And I have read it probably around twenty times. And so it's really is uh, it's what an amazing was in book, right? And uh, and it can be you know like you said, right? Uh, is just take your time just to read the book or listen to the book, right? And sometimes it's the, uh, these books have the condensed you know, knowledge, wisdom from uh, somebody's life from decades of life, right? And they kind of explain that in the beginning of the book, this book, right? He say his book was not written in a formal way, just you sat and wrote it. The, the, the book ev evolved over, you know, right? Over decades, right? He started was first just a sheet, then a booklet, and it started expanding. It was rewritten several times. So, so it's really that's where uh, I know it's really uh, we really I'm so very happy when we see our patients, our clients really using these resources because then you have uh, this easy access to this amazing wisdom, right? And the positive, typically positive message, right? They can uh, help us to have a more positive uh, outlook on our daily life, right? Because that is, yeah. Absolutely. And you, know, you could, somebody could ask you, you know, <clears throat> what's the best book for depression or what's the best book for anxiety or what's mm -hmm. the best, best book for financial literacy? And, you know, it's not as easy as that. We use, mm -hmm. we use categories, right. Yeah, to yeah. try and explain what somebody is going through, what I'm going through, what you're going through. Um, mental health aside, mental health sometimes has a lot of stigma attached to it, but everybody experiences these prime emotions. Everybody experiences anger, depression, sadness, grief, loss, transition. Everybody experiences life problems, financial housing, relationships. Nobody's the exception. And so these are all facets of the human condition. And so when, rather than think about what's the best book for this overall category, I would challenge anyone watching or listening to this to ask yourself, what are my hurdles? What, have, what has gotten in the way of progress in terms of satisfaction and quality of life? You know, looking for a, a theme, particular problems or issues. And then what are your goals, right? Oftentimes we talk about problems, 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 but it's really important to think about strength, strength, strengths, right? What strengths can we maximize? How can we sharpen a particular saw, you know, in terms of 
an area of passion, areas of interest, and also how can we learn to better problem solve an issue, right? So if somebody has um, anxiety and you dig a little bit deeper and you see that, oh, well, it's more of a social anxiety. Well, where does that social anxiety stem from? Well, maybe it's a self-esteem issue. Where does that self-esteem issue stem from? Um, maybe it's communication. Maybe they don't know how to initiate conversations. Maybe they don't know how to carry a conversation. Maybe they don't know how to communicate their thoughts and feelings or um, what's socially appropriate. And so this is where you get really into the nuts and bolts. And that's where books like How to Win Friends and Influence People really shine, right? Because that talks a lot about a, you know something we refer to now as um, interpersonal effectiveness or emotional intelligence. And what we know what the research says is that emotional intelligence has a much stronger indication of, quote, success in life than does IQ, right? IQ won't get you so far. Um, but a lot of people who are very smart struggle interpersonally. And they struggle in their marriages and their relationships. and They live very small lives um, and un unhappy lives because of it. And so if we can understand what is getting in your way, it can really move the needle. It's that 80-20 principle, right? If we can focus on the 20% of the skills that produce 80% of the results, then those, you know, it, it's it's almost magic, right? Because then you, you know what really to focus on in terms of uh, your quality of life. And it has a lot to do with what you want. There are plenty of people who are introverts who are, you know, don't want that big of a social circle. They don't really get bothered, you know, by not having a lot of friends. And so that may not be as important to them. Now, that's a general statement, but you understand my point is that what, what work, what meets one person's need will not, you know, help another person. And so I, that's where the, you know, the work that you and I do, and whether that's mental health or life coaching or um, pastoral counseling or any kind of mentor trying to help somebody else you know along their way as a guide you know that's oftentimes the goal right it's helping somebody figure out what they want and how to get it from themselves how to ask for it of themselves and other people and sometimes that comes down to a skill set social skills sometimes that comes down to problem solving skills sometimes that comes down to um goal planning right and so Again, that's the beauty of books, but figuring out what your need is first is really important. And then drilling down, you know, a mile deep, right, on those issues. A lot of people try and go two miles wide and then, an, you know, an inch deep. Um, but then you're kind of playing whack-a-mole. You're like, oh, well, I want to work on this over here and I want to work on this over here and I want to work on this over here. And then you get frustrated because you don't feel like you're making much progress. But when you figure out what really moves the needle for you or what your what areas of your life, what domains are being neglected, and you, you make an intention and purposeful decision to sharpen your saw, your tools in those areas, then it's going to have a, a holistic effect on the rest of your life, right? Because it'll help, it'll help you feel like you um, can cope better in those areas. And it has kind of a ripple effect on others, right? When you work on your relationship skills, your people skills, that's going to help you in the workplace and school, right? That makes sense? I fully, uh, it makes all the sense for me and uh, uh, Patrick. And then uh, I was just, just thinking here, you know, again, how, how much you, you we, again, we, we can learn in a the therapy, can learn in the books, right? And, uh, you know, I agree with you. Sometimes we, it's, it's hard to tell which, exactly which book would be the most most useful for, uh, you know, in a, in a, as a group for all patients with anxiety and depression, right? And also, but there, you know, we, can limit a little bit sometimes by the age group, right? The style of the books was written, but there's a lot of self-learning, right? As uh, our patients or clients start reading the books, sometimes they realize there was a related topic they have to work more on, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this uh, self-learning pathway, right? And then uh, one story, let me share share with you. I like to share that I have like, uh, you know, have at my website is uh, I have uh, toward the end, I have a, a, a list of books, I, I, uh, the most amazing books I've ever read. So I have here the, and, and that's, uh, I feel, uh, I, I think you're probably going to like this first, uh, this second one here. It's called No Great Not Without Goodness. How a Father's Law Change a Company and Spark a Movement by the Randy Lewis. Kind of relate a little bit to 
one of the the the, the message you're telling here about uh, not, maybe not focusing necessarily on the the negatives, right? Because uh, uh, one concern that sometimes I have about we in mental health, of course, we we want to help our, our patients, our clients, but. Uh, there, I do see a risk each time I, I see a patient in my office. Is the, 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 the risk is they will only remember uh, the, the diagnosis or that will come, mm -hmm. can come across as a negative, right? But uh, a lot, it, it, that definitely we don't want that. And I need the story about the, the, this book, No Greats, No Goodness by Randy Lewis. So let me, I'll tell a little bit about the story, the book. So I saw the, the, the author, this book, Randy Lewis, to speak in a conference, a learning disorder conference in Chicago in 2015. So they invited him to, to talk, right? He was a one of the previous CEOs of uh, Walgreens Pharmacies in the US, right? So, okay, I'll spoil the end of the, the, the book, but still, you know, still recommend to try to read it one day. You're going to like it. So, the, so, so he was, again, he was one of the CEOs of Walgreens Pharmacy. So his son has autism, right? So he initiated a movement to employ people with disabilities. So people have, let's say, a learning disorders or autistic spectrum disorder. So because he realized a lot of times they, they, they were not given a chance, right? Okay, so he initiated that movement. And then, and they start employing them. And uh, okay, making making a, sh uh, a, sh a long story sh uh, short, they end up the disabled people again with learning disorders or uh, autism. They end up being more productive than the normal pe people. Okay, so these disabled people mm. became more productive than the normal people. And how that happened? It happened because they hired by what they did well. <laughs> they hired by mm -hmm. the abilities, not by the abilities. And and sometimes again, again, we all we all have uh, you know limitations. You know the the, the story. You know I, I do have uh, you know we all have you know we all have something. You know I know sometimes people ask me, oh, I don't know somebody normal. I don't know anybody. <laughs> Completely don't have anything. You know an mm -hmm. limitation. You know and uh, I know it was evident for you, but you know it's no secret. But I have a Tourette syndrome. It's, it's not mm -hmm. severe, but I have Tourette syndrome. I have probably mild degree of some OCD and have attention problems too. And but you know and uh, when I was in high school and then my last year in high school, I would uh, exercise every day in the morning. You know uh, I would do swim four times a week and then my attention span was better and then I could be a good student so and now I know we're talking before uh, I, I use uh, audio books the text of speech to read because I read slowly I never been tested formally but I probably have a mild degree dyslexia like, so my spelling is not very good but I you know I, again I can't read uh, but uh, I just read slowly so using the technology is no longer a limitation for me so there is again we all have ways to to develop scoping skills. So sometimes I do share the stories with uh, my patients and the families because say, really uh, my story in a way becoming a psychiatrist is really a story of overcoming these challenges, right? And then uh, because if uh, maybe I have not overcome these challenges, I will, I will be defined by my limitations, but, but my limitations don't define me. You know, they, they, my inattention don't define me. Uh, you know, it did cause me a lot of stress when I was in, in university in the beginning of medical school because back then I did not realize, I didn't know I have attention problems. Uh, mm -hmm. I even, and I enter, I start medical school. Sometimes I will not uh, remember what the teacher was saying at the end of the class. So I thought that maybe I had a hearing problem. So mm -hmm. I went to check my hearing. My hearing was normal. And I was like, oh, I couldn't understand how I don't remember then what they're saying. That took me a few years until I fully clicked. It was just, it was just distracted, right? And when I was in high school, I have more control of my, my work schedule, my uh, study time. I could study in the way it was work for me. I could uh, exercise in the morning, do a lot of breaks, right? Then I would sit in the classroom, university, you know, all day long. It was just a nightmare, right? It was just, that was really, so I kind of learned uh, how bad that was, right? So. So can I, I, I remember that every day when I see children that were struggling in school, right? Because it was in a way what happened to me in university until I realized how to fix that. Then I fixed and then things ended up doing well. Okay, just going back to the, the, the these books, right? So so the thing, you know, uh, you know, like the story of the uh, No Great no, Without Goodness from Randy Lewis, again, he, it, it's really, oh, it's such a beautiful story. It's a real story, right? And then, uh, and, then and that's really what I f feel that's the story, in a way, I, I, I dream would be the story we would like our patients to, to have, right? Because, you know, you probably agree with me, like, say, keep people, uh, anxious people. You know, when I see anxious people say, you know, okay, anxiety can cause suffering. I'll try to minimize the suffering anxiety can cause. But 
But you, you, your anxious people are good people, are, are nice people. You know, so the anxious people are the nicest people you see around because they, so in a way they are anxious because they're nice. They're good. They're good. They, they are they worried because they don't want things to go wrong. They don't want to make mistakes. They want to upset mm -hmm. others. So come from goodness, right? So mm -hmm. these the things, two sides of the same coin, right? They sometimes the anxiety come together with all the strengths, right? So I think right. we want to kind of have this awareness. Yes, we can focus on the strengths too, right? But at the same time, maybe say you have a weakness, you maybe you're overwhelming, you know, maybe you're uh, still uh, too connected how the way you feel to how people accept you or not. So then, okay, then you, there is books can help you on that. There's the talk therapy can help you on that. So we can correct that. So so I, I think, well, again, we'll have something, right, that we, we have to overcome, right? So we I, I agree. We have to all of look for ways to, to overcome these limitations, either limitations because we were too much or because we're a bit distracted. So it could be maybe exercise, pay attention to uh, good sleep or a medication for the itchy can be valid too, right? So again, we will develop and that kind of, that's why I think that the, the, the slide, right? The success attributes, right? So being self-aware, proactive, because, you know, uh, this is really, that's why I think when we, we, we develop the skills, right? And then again, being self-aware, let's say, so if somebody has anxiety, okay, you, you, I am an anxious person, you realize that, but then you're proactive, you look for a counselor, you read the, the, the self-help books, you per, uh, perseverate, so you continue with a plan of doing that, to set goals, yes, okay, I have a few uncomfortable to talk in front of others, so I have a goal to start ordering food in a, you know first in a, in a order food for the family. We go to eat all together, and then I'm going to order by myself, right? So set goals for things you want to achieve, right? And you you have support system could be support from family for therapies, right? So again, this uh, all these these skills are really so tight, so closely related to to our work. So I thought, oh, that's interesting. Let me talk with you about it, right? Yeah. And again, I mean, we could drill down on each of those and really break them down, like even self-awareness. I mean, everything begins with self-awareness. That's why there's such a push these days for mindfulness. Mm -hmm. You know, mindfulness is so important because if we're not aware of even why we're having, not just the emotions we're having, but where the emotions are coming from and the, th the, the thoughts that are driving them, and then if those thoughts are even accurate, right? Or if there's something being neglected within us. And we could use all different examples, but if you take somebody with anxiety, one of the biggest challenges, especially social anxiety is, like you said, very well-intended motivations, right? But they, that's not because they, they want to be antisocial, it's because they're fear of being judged, right? But like you said, every, nobody is the exception. Everybody has their bag, everybody has their hangups. And most people are, you know, actually, self-conscious themselves and so if an anxious you know trying to help an anxious person understand that their fear that other people are judging them is skewed because other people are probably thinking the same thing right most people are not even that interested in each other they're too much up in their head about themselves and worry about what other people are thinking about them and so helping someone do this kind of reality testing to reframe their thoughts or challenge their thoughts so that they can have more self-awareness about what's going on will help them show up as their their most confident self because they'll understand that everybody is worried about how they're being perceived on some level. And when you're able to kind of step away from that and not take yourself so seriously, right? Not get so hung up on how you think other people are what they're thinking about you and understand that most people are focused on what you, what you're comfortable with. If you're uncomfortable, it makes other people uncomfortable. If you're, if you're worried about yourself, other people, you know, if, and that plays out in your behavior, right? If, if you're self-conscious, then <clears throat> and we can get into some CBT stuff like negative filtering, right? Um, if we, if we go deep in it, but like if somebody pays you a compliment, and you minimize it and you're overly humble or you kind of deflect it. And then somebody gives you a constructive criticism and you blow it out of proportion. What you're doing in effect is teaching other people these unspoken boundaries about not don't compliment you, right? Because it makes you uncomfortable and they can see that. And so um, that's kind of the, the implications of things like anxiety when it goes unchecked, 
right? And people don't necessarily understand or make that connection about how their behavior is teaching other people how to interact with them because in, in a lot of ways, they're actually trying to respect your wishes. And so that's, yeah, self-insight is so important to understand why we're behaving the way we are and the impact of that behavior, that conduct. Yeah, and that's the that, environment. Right? That's the f first the item, right? Self awareness, right? The first item. Yeah. I think they're right on the money there. Yeah, so I fully agree. Self awareness, because on it, like I said, when you are aware of something, then the first step, right, to make a plan to correct it, right? But if you're not aware or you don't you want to ignore the problem, that's really hard to to overcome there, right? And also, you I know you're talking about uh, about um, or mindfulness or meditation. Of course, these are, are super. I know we're super powerful for anxiety and depression too. Yeah, one story that uh, I, I like to share about one of these books. You know, I, I read. Uh, you know, I mentioned that I read the How to Win Friends Influence People over twenty times, about twenty times. And uh, there's another one. The, the second book I read more than ten times. The only two I, I think I read more than ten times to, uh, so far is the book How. Um, how to Stop Worrying and Start Living, also by mm -hmm. Dale Carnegie. So these two books from Dale Carnegie are the, the only two books I read more than mm -hmm. them or 10 yeah. times. And I think it's, it's another amazing book, right? And then, uh, and, um, and so the story I tell families, and I, without getting into many, too much uh, personal details, more intimate details, I say, uh, you know, years ago, I was really worried about a family member to the point I was uh, not even you know, sleeping well, I was really worrying a lot, right? So I decided to reread that book. So I read that book and that, that there was one part talks about acceptance, right? So he talks about accept the worst and improve from that. So that I thought, okay, can I preve prevent my family member from developing these and uh, these problems? No, I cannot. Can I make things better if this this illness uh, happen? Yes, I can. So that suddenly I didn't have this huge burden in my back and something that was just, or this worrying, you know, it's like a worry beetle, right? Like the, uh, the Kearney talk about it, like an oak, right? You can have a big oak, but the eaters go there and keep eat the oak and the, the uh, tree die, right? So the, the, the beetles of the worrying can really dry and drain your energy, right? Mm -hmm. So, so this uh, acceptance of what I have found, you know, reading, rereading this book, for me, it was was actually one of the most powerful things, just was acceptance. And and then I when I once kind of start reading more of these other books and learning more about you know, of course, meditation, acceptance. I think that's really one of the most powerful things. Is just acceptance. Sometimes we have to accept a few things. You know, for me, one thing I accepted. Yes, I'm a little bit have tend to be a little bit an anxious person, and uh, you know that's the way I am. We just have to watch. You know, be careful. But you know, there are things you just have to accept, right? And then then uh, it seems like once you accept it. You just don't worry as much about it. It's, it's no longer a focus of your mind, and it becomes a smaller problem, right? So I'm a big fan of this, this concept. Yeah, <clears throat> we only have so much mental RAM to go around, right? Any given time, um, you, know, we, you know, we talk a lot about radical acceptance and counseling because once you accept something as being a possible truth, then you can you have a choice as whether you can you can choose to attend to that and problem solve or put your attention elsewhere, right? And uh, it's fascinating, right? Not not having our mind so tied up in things that are outside of our control. And, you know, another challenge, right, is figuring out what's what are priorities in terms of where our energy goes. We only have so much gas in our tank, right? And especially if you're if you're if you're struggling with um, depression or anxiety, you know, you might wake up. You never know what you're going to wake up with. Maybe you have an eighth of a tank of gas so you really have to prioritize where that energy goes and it's very easy to spend it up mentally on you know spinning your wheels on things that are either irrelevant uh not relevant right now right or not advantageous and knowing what's most advantageous for where you put your energy very important very important and acceptance is a big part of that because if you can accept the things that are not relevant right now or things you can't control that allow that frees up the mental energy and time to to put it elsewhere but that can't happen without the insight right and the the awareness yeah moving beyond that like you were saying being proactive right when if you if, if the socially anxious person learns to accept their social anxiety then they can learn how to be proactive again being very specific though right um so if, if somebody says i i now know that i struggle with making introductions well guess what proactive looks like Maybe when they walk into a room, they eat they eat the frog, as it's called. They do the hardest thing first, and they introduce themselves. 
to someone. Maybe that's their new rule, right? Their assumption is I'm, I'm, I'm going to have a hard time making an introduction. So my rule to overcome that is the first thing I do out the gate is I go and I introduce myself to someone, break the ice. Yeah, and that kind of connects the, the thought process, right? I know we're talking then a little bit more focused on the anxiety, of course, then it will be the, the realization that, uh, you know, the biggest uh, enemy of, of anxiety problems is uh, avoidance, right? Avoidance mm -hmm. is the number one, right? When you feel avoid, you know, avoid, avoid, avoid the thing you're afraid, you know, you, you just see it's very hard to overcome anxiety problems, right? Okay. Absolutely. Patrick, that was a very, uh, very interesting conversation. Again, okay, thank you for it. again your first that time for us to have this talk, and I think it was uh, super interesting. You know, as uh, again, I think uh, again we we'll talk a little bit about self help books, talk about uh, uh, these factors, right? We we know that uh, again it was were based on studies done in you know in children in Asia, but again it's very interesting how this success attribute really relate strongly to a, a success in adult life, right? These are really the traits I think we, we want or, uh, or uh, we would like everybody to develop over time, right? How being self-aware needs to, again, you're aware of the problem difficulties you have and then can move to be proactive, make a plan how to overcome that. If you, and just don't quit this, you know, insist on it, make a plan how to achieve that, right? And uh, use uh, support system if you need a counselor, a counselor, friends, you know, support groups, right? And then uh, and over time, we want you to, you're going to develop in the scoping skills with all this, again, the, the books, therapy. So, you know, I think that's really is kind of the recipe, right? For a healthy adult life. And I think it was, uh, I fully agree with you that uh, I think we all, you know, we all have challenges, right? We all have uh, limitations and uh, really the, but the story we went to try to write for us is that, you know, how do we overcome these challenges and we don't no longer become defined by them, right? And I think I feel like we both have, I don't know, have different maybe life stories, but they, I think we both overcame some uh, challenges early on, right? And then allow oh, us to maybe probably empathize better with uh, our, uh, our the, the families we try to help, right? Yeah, and I think it's really important too to just keep, you know, be transparent, you know, with, with others that, no, everybody has struggles. Everybody. If you look at any successful person, you know, it's easy to look at the, take it at, you know, face value and just look at the highlights, right? But we don't see the film strip. That's the problem with social media. People just go around, you know, a lot of it is just people putting their highlight reels out there. And you don't see behind the, the behind the scenes, right? Is, is how challenging things actually are, right? And even in personal relationships, a lot of people don't offer you know, a backstage pass to what's going on, you know, behind the scenes and their struggles. And that's what makes, you know, best friend so special, right? Is because you get that back, you get the backstory. Um, and that's what the problem with comparative thinking, right? And especially in today's world is you go around and you can say, oh, I don't, I don't have it as good as that person or that person so much better at this than I am. And it's easy to get down on yourself. And the only, the only person we should be comparing ourselves to is ourselves, right? Our personal best. Because that's the only true baseline we have. If we go around measuring ourselves to other people all the time, the, the ruler is always changing and it's enough to drive you mad, right? It's not, it's not a baseline. It's not a true baseline. And comparative thinking is helpful in the sense that's how we learn about the world. That's how we learn what's socially acceptable growing up. That's object relations. But, you know, as, as adults, when it comes to personal development, not such a good measure. Not such a good tool. So, um, yeah, books can help with that for sure. Um, I don't know if I had mentioned, but I put together a, a, a kind of a database of my favorite books by category, mm -hmm. like you did. Um, it's on, uh, if you go to mhtgear.com, mhtgear.com, I have everything outlined there. Um, it's through kit.co. So, my site does uh, get a little bit of a kickback at no extra cost via commissions, but it's like pennies. So, <laughs> but I put it together mostly um, as a resource for myself. So when I'm referring books um, to other people, I can quickly kind of use it as a reference, you know, reference point. So that that's your 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 page yeah, here, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'll put the, I'll, I'll include the link. I have it broken down by by category of my favorite books. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's excellent. I think your, your page yeah. is a little bit better organized than mine. <laughs> oh, well, I can see here. Oh, you see the same book we just mentioned, it. How yeah. to Influence Friends People is here too. Yeah, I think yeah. we have a few similar items here. Okay. So I personally gravitate toward practical wisdom. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite. 
you know, practical wisdom on behavior change, like Atomic Habits, you see for under personal developments. It's one of my favorites. Atomic Habits too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I've read pretty much all of those at least mm -hmm. once. Mm -hmm. um, Excellent. Yeah, good stuff. Um, but yeah, I think learning to, to take proactive steps toward personal development, like that that list of of coping skills you were talking about, you know, once you have the insight to know what the problem is, and then you're you're proactive about taking steps, and then persistence, like you said, we sometimes call that resilience, but what we're really talking about is consistency, being consistent in your efforts, right? So you don't you don't um, start a podcast once and it was helpful, and then you, you never open it again. You make it a mantra. You say every time I go for my thirty minute walk in the morning, I'm listening to this podcast or this YouTube channel or this audiobook because it it's priming my mind for the thing I want to become or the things I want to work on, right? And that goes hand in hand with goal setting, right? Because the goal setting is about start beginning with the end in mind and working backward, right? It's about goal pacing. It's setting the milestones and learning little by little and then asking ourselves, how can we apply this to our lives? This knowledge that I'm absorbing, okay, so this is all well and good, but how do I apply it now? So it's all of those things, right? And I think it's not just a one and done. It's a, it's a constant flow of being. These are skills that we're trying to incorporate in our lives on a consistent basis. Constantly goal setting, reevaluating, measuring, improving, um, figuring out what's the next relevant information that we need to move to the next goal, right? And it's, it's not easy to be consistent. We all struggle with that, to be sure. Patrick, that's excellent. I really, again, I really uh, enjoyed uh, talking with you today. Great. And uh, I'll check the, the list of books you recommend too, because I can see here uh, several I do not read yet. So I have to put in my in my list of books to read. But I, and I was happy to see several I, I, I know too. The Laws of Leadership, uh, Smart, Faster, Better. You know, I have really good one, Charles Dunn. Yeah, Power of Habits. Atomic habits, yes, I have. I think I think have read maybe half, but I think I now have a, a long list of books more to read. Okay, so I'll we'll include all the links for the uh, include for your page, everything in uh, in the video description, right? And I know as we always end these videos, you know, you know, uh, we hope our viewers uh, found these videos to the video to be helpful. But of course, this is not a replacement for the device of a mental health care provider. If you're struggling with depression, anxiety, other other mental health problem. Please look for advice for your mental health care provider or your, your family doctor, uh, and then the family doctor or a pediatrician, depending on age, who may make a referral for either a counselor or a psychiatrist. But uh, the, yeah, this, this video, we hope the video was helpful, but of course, it's not a replacement for a device of your health care provider. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you, Patrick, for. Uh, Thank you so uh, much, Alex. I appreciate being on your show and taking having a chat, and always a pleasure. Thank you.